Okay, chapter 9, protection against invaders. All right, so pathogens are microorganisms which can cause disease. So you've got bacteria, viruses, fungi, parasites. You can also have pollution and toxins. Uh, we will be mainly focusing on the bacteria and viruses with a few fungi and parasites. Okay, this is a table straight out of your textbook. Uh, you can have a look at this and I would learn probably five or so examples of both bacteria and viruses um, and then also know a few common parasites and fungi. Okay, so a little a bit about bacteria. We know that some are helpful, uh, helpful. they can aid digestion, decompose de decaying matter, part of the nitrogen cycle and you often find the good acidophilus bacteria in yoghurt, etc. Next year, in Year 12, we'll learn about recombinant DNA technology. They're single-celled, and they are classified according to the shape of their cell, and ignore the brain pop. Okay, viruses, very small, so they require an electron microscope to be seen. Um, they've got their own genetic material um, surrounded by a protein coat, and they have uh, DNA and RNA. This will make a little bit more sense later on in the year when we start studying DNA. Um, to, for viruses to actually replicate, they require another living cell, so they're often found, this is how they replicate, is in going into a host. Um, and that's how they can um, multiply. Viruses can also invade bacteria, and these are called bacteriophages. Some are actually useful, so not all of them are bad news. Okay, virus, this is what they look like. Really quite different to um, de um, bacteria, sorry. A lot smaller as well. Here are some common viral infections. Okay, this is similar to the table that I showed you before, so you can pause this later on and have a look if you like. Just shows you the parts of the body that are inf are um, inf infected by these viruses. Okay, fungi, they're their own kind kingdom. So you got an um, animalia, etc., and fungi is its own kingdom as well. Um, you use common fungi in baking such as yeasts um, they're also used in the production of antibiotics and they have a cell wall made of chitin which is more sort of a biology plant animal point here some animal parasites that you would have heard of are fleas ticks hair lice the difference between Endo and ectoparasites. Endoparasites live on the inside of the host, so they could be worm things such as worms or amoeba, whereas ectoparasites live on the outside of the host. Okay, so now we're going to be reviewing the first line of defence. So we're looking at all sort of the, the physical um, and the chemical barriers to the to the disease. So everything that prevents it from entering inside the cells. Okay, so lots of parts of the body are a part of the external defence system. They're physical and chemical bar barriers to stop the microorganisms. Um, chemical barriers are actually able to destroy the microorganisms, whereas physical stop them from getting in. Skin is the first major barrier, um, but openings to your body must be defended in other ways. Okay, again, a familiar diagram which we've been looking at out of the textbook. Okay, so I would know each of those and know what they all do. Okay, quite an important one. Okay, the skin contains an outer layer of keratin and that makes it uh, relatively impenetrable to microbes anyway. 
It's also covered in hair um, and each hair has got a little oil gland that secretes sebum. Um, this sebum or this oil keeps the skin quite waterproof as well um, and the sebum is a chemical barrier. Some microorganisms are useful which live on the surface and they compete with other path pathogens for nutri nutrients and space, um, which this keeps the population of the unuseful pathogens down. This is a cross-section of some skin. So here, a couple of important parts. Here is sweat gland, um, and we've got the upper dermis of the skin here. A sebaceous gland is here. This is what lets the sebum out. Um, so the oil is located at the base of each hair. You've got mucous membranes as well, which line the inner surface of your body. These form a physical barrier inside of your mouth, nose, alimentary canal and your respiratory tract. It's thick and sticky, which means it traps microorganisms. Uh, the cells that produce mucus are called goblet cells. Uh, the mucus you can then cough out or you swallow down into your digestive tract. Okay, this is what goblet cells look like. Um, now, we don't, we don't do a lot with goblet cells in year 11, but you just so that you are aware, uh, this diagram here showing you that's the goblet cell and epithelium is, so this area is your, it's all your skin, but this is your upper dermis. So it's located fairly close to the upper dermis of the skin. Okay, tears contain lysozyme, uh, which is an enzyme, and it's another chemical barrier which is able to destroy microorganisms. When you blink, it spreads the liquid over the surface of your eye and lysozyme is also found in your saliva and in mucus. Okay, so this is just divides it into physical and chemical barriers. So you've got um, physical being skin, microorganisms, cilia, um, membranes that contain cells that produce mu mucus, so there's talking about the goblet cells. Chemical barriers, you've got sebum, stomach acid, which has got a pH of 2. Okay, so it's very acidic. And you've also got lysozyme in tears. Okay, moving on to the protective reflexes. Okay, so the protective reflexes are sneezing, coughing, vomiting and diarrhoea. Um, all fairly self-explanatory. But the idea is to um, project the microbes out of the systems as soon as they possibly can. So sneezing caused by stimulating the nerves within the nose. Coughing, again, in the respiratory tract, so through the trachea and the bronchi. Vomiting is um, stimulated in the brain but contracts the stomach muscles to induce vomiting. Diarrhea is uh, when the small intestine and large intestine are stimulated to produce uh, muscle spasms which creates diarrhea. Okay, blood clotting. So this is also a first line of defense. We've been over blood clotting before, but um, we want blood clotting to occur so that we don't allow any more microbacteria in or um, any other viruses in, but we also don't want to lose too much blood. Um, so, first of all, platelets stick to the broken section, and as more platelets settle, they continue to stick until a plug is formed. Those platelets will release vasoconstrictors, um, and generally this will occur normally in most people. Um, but there is a condition known as, hmm, what is it? Haemophilia. Haemophilia, that's right, where you can't, your blood won't clot properly. So you lack those um, clotting factors in the blood. Okay, clotting factors are present in the plasma. 
fibrin forms a mesh which traps the platelets and the blood cells which forms a clot. Um, so retraction then occurs because the clot needs to then be removed. So fibrin retract which pulls the damaged blood vessels together. You then get a serum type uh, fluid leaking out. The clot will dry and forms the scab and this prevents entry of microorganisms. Scab will then eventually um, dry out fully, heal and then fall off. Alright, so this is just going over our lines of defence. We've got, um, we've done our physical and chemical barriers and so we've done um, the barriers themselves, we've done uh, our reflexes and we've also done clotting. Oh, isn't it? Oh no, mine is. Yours isn't. That's weird. Okay, um, so we've got the second line of defence we're going to be going into now will be inflammation, the inflammatory response, and ingestion of bacteria by white blood cells, or as well in there is going to be macrophages. Very difficult to write on this thing. Okay, so the pathogen specific defences, as I've said a couple of times, that's not till year 12. And that's your third line of defence. Okay, so if you've got microorganisms that have penetrated your first line of defence, your... Okay, so the first uh, phase of the, the second line of defence is um, phagocytosis. White blood cells are carried around in the bloodstream, um, which engulf invading microorganisms and digest them. Um, as you remember, we've covered penocytosis or, and also phagocytosis. So that could be the cell eating and cell drinking. In this case... We're discussing white blood cells. You can also be discussing macrophages as well. Secondly is the inflammatory response. This is the body's response to tissue injury. Inflammation can be felt as redness, warmth and pain. They're called inflammation. This damage is quickly cleared up so that new tissue can grow and repair the break in the skin. Pus can sometimes form, which is a yellowish fluid. It includes white blood cells, living and dead bacteria, dead tissue and blood plasma. If uh, pus is developed under the skin, it can become trapped and forms an abscess. Next to the damaged skin releases chemicals that make the blood vessels swell. More blood flows, which creates a warm feeling and the redness. Tissue in the area swells as the fluid leaks from capillaries. This causes pain. White blood cells move to the area and digest dead cells and bacteria. So here's a visual diagram of what happens. So tissue becomes damaged by a pin, for example. Histamine is released from the mast cells. The capillary becomes more permeable, so plasma leaks out. This causes pain. Antibodies then leak out of the blood, including uh, mast cells. White blood cells leave through the capillary wall as it is more permeable. A wall of fibrin begins to form around the site of infection. Pus then forms and there you have it. So the lymphatic system is next. It consists of a network of lymph capillaries joined into the larger lymph vessels. Lymph nodes, which are located along with the length, with the length of some lymph vessel. Low pressure and does not need a pump for movement. Okay, so you've got the diagram there of some capillaries and you can also see the lymph vessels in green uh, 
around the capillaries so they need blood supply close by to be able to absorb um, absorb the material into the lymph okay so this is just the diagram describing the interaction between cells and blood capillaries so we've got um, fluid leaving the capillary 90% of the fluid that leaves the capillaries is actually returned and 10% that doesn't return comes part of the interstitial fluid and the interstitial fluid being between the cells and the uh, blood capillaries it's got a similar composition to plasma contains no red blood cells uh, and has large protein molecules as well as water, lymphocytes granulocytes, respiratory gases, nutrients, hormones, ions and urea. Okay, so that's just a, a um, flow chart of movement between lymphatic capillary right through to the collecting duct. The function of the lymphatic system is to drain fluid from around the cells, absorb fat from the intestines, as we learnt about the um, inside the villi. The lymphatic system, the function is to circulate the lymph, filter the lymph and also to aid immunity. This is just a diagram of your lymphatic system. So focusing here on the, the nodes in each of those main areas, so um, around under your neck, you've got some in the side of your face, armpits, groin, um, and internally and in the abdomen area as well. Okay, so the structure of the lymph, um, you've got entry and exit points to the lymph node uh, and the these parts being the vessels Okay, so you don't worry too much about the B lymphocytes and the T lymphocytes. This is for mainly next year. So the structure of the lymphatic system. Lymph vessels pass through a series of lymph nodes. The vessels are thin-walled veins like tubes, vein-like tubes that carry lymph. They're small bean-like brain-shaped structures, sorry, that contain high concentrations of macrophages and also lymphocytes, which explains why um, it will drain infections to the lymph nodes due to those high concentrations of macrophages and white blood cells. Okay, so the spleen, thymus gland, tonsils, Payers patches in the gut and the appendix. They contain lymphatic tissue but are not actually part of the lymphatic system. So more about the lymph nodes, that they filter the lymph for the lymphatic fluid. Um, they filter it from microorganisms and they deal with cancer cells as well. Um, so the lymphocytes and the monocytes, again, we learn more a little bit about next year. Okay, so the next part is telling you about what you can do to prevent um, entry of invading microorganisms into your body. So protecting yourself and also protecting others around you. So have good hygiene, washing your hands, covering your mouth, wearing gloves, wipe surfaces with disinfectant, um, and especially when you are in the medical industry, using tongs, pliers or tweezers when disposing of needles, or especially if you find one in the park, for example. Personal items just means things like drink bottles where you might share saliva and things like that. So mechanical barriers could be surgical masks, gloves, protective clothing and safety glasses. 
Okay, so the next couple of slides are really self-explanatory things that you can do to um, relieve pain associated often with the uh, immune system. Analgesics include the following. However, these can sometimes have consequences on the body. Excuse the spelling mistake. Kidney disorders, stomach disorders, high blood pressure, joint deteriorate, deterioration and resilience. Something that's a topical preparation is used on the skin as follows. Something that's an antimicrobial is a chemical which assists the immune system. So you can have antibiotics which only deal with bacteria, not viruses. And antifungals which can destroy fungi. Drug resistance, as I was talking about in class the other day, can be through overuse and inappropriate diagnosis. So going to the doctor for the flu, your doctor should not be prescribing you antibiotics because the influenza is a virus and antibiotics only destroys bacteria. So it's going to do nothing except make you more immune to antibiotics or resistant to it. And then just a few websites for you if you like a bit more info.